Now it's now we're recording. Anyway, so here's the Gaia spacecraft. Uh, first first device is the Astro uh, astrometric instrument. Photometric. This one measures spectra and light curves. And look at the band, especially for this one. Let me get my cursor over here. Come on, cursor. All right, here we go. Look at that band. Okay, thir 320 nanometers to 1,000 nanometers. Okay, visible light is 400 to 700 nanometers, as we know. So that's Roy G. Biv. Actually, that's uh, Roy G. Biv in reverse, 400 for V and 700 for R. So this is catching some ultraviolet from 320 up to about 400. Uh, and it's catching a little bit of infrared, what we would call near infrared, NIR. Okay, and it's measuring, you know, so all the spectra that we can dig out of the data for that, um, you know, is, is uh, you know, part of the task of this particular spacecraft. Uh, the radial velocity spectrometer. Okay, I've emphasized in this paragraph the word Dop the phrase Doppler effect. This is the one where it it will be able to tell if it's moving radially away from you. And it radially means uh, toward toward you or away from you um, as you gaze along the radius of a sphere whose center is your telescope. Okay, so if you think of the entire universe as um, displayed anyways, visually on a sphere all around you, um, then the motion of a star away from you would be along a radius outward. Uh, if it's coming toward you, you would want to measure how quickly. And the Doppler effect will show you that, as I mentioned last time. Uh, so if you measure Doppler shift uh, in H alpha or any other uh, line, spectral line, uh, and, and this one is very precise. This one's at an infrared, 847 to 874 nanometers. The, what, you know, I wish I, I should have looked this up. They're looking at a very s specific line or set of lines here. There's a very narrow range. And uh, by looking at the um, shortening or lengthening of a spectral line that they know that they've got, um, they can judge the, the speed. All right, now, each of these functions is accomplished on this focal plane. So this, this little image over here tells you, this is kind of a layout of the thing at the back end of the telescope. You know, all the light rays are focused onto this uh, device here, all these uh, de different detectors. And that's a little bit different from uh, earlier uh, observation platforms like Hubble, I think, has, uh, and some of the other uh, space telescopes have uh, separate telescopes for aiming and stuff like this. This one, they're all here. So here's the astrometric CCD. That's a fancy name for a uh, photo detector. Uh, sky mapper that tells you where, uh, how you map, uh, map out the sky. Uh, here's blue photometric, here's red photometric. So this allows you to, to get, um, uh, you know, these two different colors, the reds and the blues, and figure out the, the temperature of the surface of the star. And then here's your radial velocity, radial velocity spectrometer over here. So it's a, it's a pretty fancy device. It's going to be good. Um, and... Uh, you know, we'll be analyzing that till the cows come home. Probably get millions of stars. Uh, okay, clicker questions. I have a clicker question coming up for you. Get your clickers ready. We'll do a couple clicks. And this is by way of review for uh, what we talked about at the end of last class. And, and then I'll ask you a little bit about Gaia here. But the first question is about the Kepler spacecraft. So turn on your device, frequency AA, and let's go. What was the method that the Kepler spacecraft searched for exoplanets? Read very carefully.
30 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys have got here. Uh, looks like we got a, a spread of values. Uh, people have voted for A, B, C, D, and E. Let's take a look at it. Uh, the correct answer is B. Uh, and 63% of you answered that. Um, the parallax angle for each exoplanet, they're not going to be able to dig that out. A to get a parallax, you have to have, you know, a good amount of light. And the planets are not emitting light. They're, they're actually blocking light. And because of that, they cause dips in the planet's light curve that we can measure. That's B. Recording the spectral lines of each parent star and then double checking against the sun spectrum. That won't tell you much about planets. It will tell you about the composition of that star, but not about planets. Uh, option D, analyzing the H alpha line of each exoplanet Kepler, or of, a, of each exoplanet candidate, the famous KOI, Kepler object of interest. Uh, no, that's not what you do. And, uh, and again, the, the reason for that is that you're not going to pick up a lot of H alpha from the star itself, from the candidate itself. Calibrating black body spectrum and surface temperature of the parent star. No, you don't need that. We already know how to do that. Kepler spacecraft is not dedicated to that. Here's another question. Question two. Kepler team found that. Kepler is a really nice device, but I think it's out of commission now, unlike Hubble. Hubble is like the Babe Ruth of spacecraft. It's Hubble Space Telescope. It's been repaired and come back for more. Been repaired a couple times. Maintain, maintenance, and repair. Uh, 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, let's see what you guys voted for. Yeah, it's you remember correctly, most of you. Uh, if, if you voted, only two people voted for B. That one is is false completely. Um, a used to be true, and I mentioned that last time. Before Kepler, it was tough to find an exoplanet. Matter of fact, you know, I don't know how the first guy to bag an exoplanet did it, if he was deliberately looking or not, but uh, it was not easy. But Kepler is just finding buku. Um, we don't know this. D, that's... That'd be nice, but it's it's probably not true. So uh, let's ask a question about Gaia. And I actually gave you the answer to this about five minutes ago. Think about it. Mr. Carlson. I feel like that guy in the Matrix. Mr. Anderson, the agent. Mr. Anderson, you can't escape from us. Yeah, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 
five, four, three, two, one, zero. Let's see what you guys voted for. Ooh, looks like I caught you guys napping. You weren't listening. You're all over the place here. Correct answer is C. And yeah, if you want to figure out its true angular motion and its proper motion, you've got to observe it for several years. One year is not enough. It's got to be, you know, you've got to race around the, the sun several times. Two times at least, because if it is moving enough to see in one year, you won't know that until you've made two parallax measurements, and they're different. So, uh, so let's keep going and talking about parallax. And let me get this um, out of here. There's a that diagram. All right, here's a here's a little bit better view of a parallax. Where's my cursor? Come on, baby. Here we go. Here's a better view. It's a very, very sharp, pointy triangle. This is an exaggeration of a real parallax measurement. This would be easy to do. Matter of fact, this would be, this would, this, that star up there, that green star at the top of the slide uh, is closer to Earth than, uh, than the moon. Uh, so we can easily bag uh, the parallax distance to the moon. That's not hard. Actually, we wouldn't even want to do that uh, on an annual basis. But anyways, the, the whole idea of, par of parallax, right here at the center of this baseline down here at the bottom, that's where the sun is. And here you are six months apart looking at a star. And this aiming angle that you take, you know, you tilt your telescope to a certain po point in the sky, if you're tilting at it at six months later at a slightly different angle, that means you're measuring some parallax. All right, now Aristotle and Galileo knew that if Earth was um, not the center of the universe, but if, if we were orbiting the sun and if the stars were all around, you know, and, and, that, and, and actually that everything was moving around the sun, that they should find parallax to a distant star, but nobody was able to measure it. Uh, they knew to look for it, they couldn't uh, get it. Uh, and so, so here's the other, this is the actual parallax angle over here. So, you know, you can think of it from June to, Ju excuse me, from June to December over here on the baseline, and then the total peak angle here divided in half, uh, and that's the actual parallax angle, half the difference in the aiming angle. First guy to get it was a guy named uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel, a German, in 1838. The star he found it in was 61 Cygni. And, you know, they were trying, everybody was trying to get it, but they didn't have a good enough uh, and accurate enough, precise enough telescope and protractor, basically. I mean, that's how you measure angles. Now we have a, you know, in 10th grade geometry class, you have a, a protractor that measures degrees, but these guys need very, very small fractions of a degree. A second of arc, one second of arc is a 3600th of a degree. Now a degree is really teeny, and a second of arc is really, really teeny. Okay, so what he measured was about 0.314 seconds of arc. So he didn't even get a full arc second. All right, but he got it. And so based on that and having a fairly good uh, idea of the distance to... Uh, why are you bringing your bike in the classroom, man? Dude, all right, good. You don't want somebody... Blazing out of here with your bike, man. I know, it's no good. Good. All right, secure now. Let's get back to business. Now, I'm going to ask you some clicker questions here in a second about 61 Cygni. So make sure you write down that uh, parallax measurement, 0 0.314 seconds of arc. So the parallax uh, system uses a distance unit called the parsec. And here's how you do it. 
if you measure one second of parallax, all right, then and you do the trig for this triangle over here, you know, and you know that you know the distance um, from base across the baseline of this triangle, Elizabeth. If you know that that's two astronomical units, roughly a thousand light seconds, then you can um, do trigonometry and figure out the distance uh, from the Earth out to this star. So what we say is that the distance is one over the angle. So whatever P is, do one over that. And that'll give you the, the distance in parsecs. All right, so... Um, one over one is one, so that, and there's no star that's one parsec away. Uh, every star that we ha have measured, it's a little bit further than that, so uh, we don't really have any stars that are one parsec. We have a couple, 61 Cygni is fairly close to a, a second of arc. Uh, so six, the distance to 61 Cygni would be one over this baby right here. All right, now, um, one parsec is equivalent to 3.26 light years, which if you read your textbook overnight, over the between classes, you'll know that, and you'll remember that. Another example, uh, Alpha Centauri A, um, the brightest star in the Alpha Centauri group. Um, that's the closest star to us, and it's fairly close. It's almost a second. It's three quarters of a second of parallax, 0 0.746. That's pretty good. It's not a second, but it's, it's getting up there. That's, and that's the closest one that we know of anyway. Uh, and that's equivalent to um, D equals 1 over P. Uh, that's equal to uh, 1.34 parsec. So make sure that you jot that down. Because I'm going to give you a question um, uh, about that, let me just check something here. Um, hold on a second. So let's do a question together now. Make sure you have the uh, stuff. Uh, let me get the little picture here. All right. How many parsecs? is the distance to 61 Cygni. And there's a picture of uh, Professor Bessel. He's got a good haircut. All right. And look at your notes. Hopefully you just wrote down that formula. It's not that hard. Uh, if you don't have a calculator, just do it out by hand. It's not that hard. Fifth grade style. I'll give you a minute. If you have your cell phone, you can do it pretty easily. See what you guys got. 30 seconds to go. Whoa. Dude. I guess I'll wait to display that. 10 seconds. I know everybody's going to change their answer. That's all right. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Let's see if you guys are geniuses or not. Uh, yeah. Correct answer is uh, C. Let me get this out of the way. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed there's supposed to be a picture of. I guess the animation here is messed up. Anyways, here's the answer. Uh, Three point one eight parsecs. Uh, all right. Let's. Um, Here's the calculation. So if you got that one wrong, let's see. Uh, 
Not too, too many of you got it wrong. There's the calculations, just one over 0 0.314. It's not too bad. Oh, and by the way, you guys, this uh, is the abbreviation for Parsec, PC. Just make a note of that. And LY is the abbreviation for light years. And astronomers, they, I don't know, some, some use parsecs, some use light years. I'm not really sure uh, why they, you know, distinguish between the two, but apparently they do. All right, 61 sig. Now, here's another question for you. Hopefully this one I won't mess up. Uh, all right, 3.18 parsecs. How many light years is that? So hopefully this is a cinchy question for you. Three point one eight parsecs. How many LYs is that? Thirty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Yeah, let's see what you guys. Yeah, that's the calculation there. Uh, here's you know if you got it wrong, a bunch of you got it wrong. Let's see about forty of you, forty-two of you got it wrong. Yeah, if you got it wrong, just jot that down. That's the calculation. 3.14, and every one parsec is 3.26 light years. So, uh, so that's how that works. And now here's the modern values for 61 sig 9. Those are those are actually the values that um, Bessel would have calculated. Um, more precise measurements. I brought it down a little bit, 3.498 parsecs and 11.41 light years. So, uh, so that's good. Now, uh, let's keep going and talk about a few more examples. Sirius, 2.64 parsecs, 8.6 light years, pretty close. And it's very bright, very, very bright. Of course, the closest star is the sun. We measure that in light seconds, not light years. Uh, Andromeda galaxy, uh, seven points or seven hundred seventy-eight thousand parsecs, two and a half million light years. Now that's not a parallax measurement, but it is. We measure the distance to galaxies and stuff using other methods. We can't triangulate a galaxy; it's too far away. We can't. And I don't even think Gaia will be able to triangulate a gal even the Andromeda galaxy. But we have other ways, and I'll tell you about other ways to measure methods, you know, using special stars. Uh, anyways, the distances in parsecs and light years are there. Now, I want to make a, um, another discussion here for the next few minutes about apparent brightness and luminosity. The reason that we've focused on triangulating the distance as many as we can is because with that we can figure out the star's luminosity. Here's a quote from page 307. I'll go ahead and jot down page 307. If we know a star's distance from its parallax angle, okay, and we've got many, many hundreds of thousands of those, uh, we can calculate its luminosity. In other words, we can know how many watts it's burning with in all directions, or how many watts per square meter are streaming out into the universe. And we can calculate that using the inverse square law for light. And, uh, and basically the inverse square law for light says that the intensity of the light is going to drop off proportional to one over R squared. Okay, so for instance, here's a picture this diagram, figure 12.1, this is 
you know, it's not to scale or anything, but here's the sun, and right down here, you, uh, it looks like a little trapezoid. It's supposed to be a little uh, portion. Wait a minute. Yeah, okay, that looks, I don't even know what, I guess that's supposed to be North America. All right, so here's a, here's a, uh, a little, you know, one square meter pixel or a one square meter uh, piece of wood or photo detector facing straight at the sun. Um, and we know that by the time it gets out to, um, you know, if you do the same thing for Mars, it's quite a bit uh, less intense. So let's um, kind of figure out the basic strategy here. And that's basically to calculate backwards. So you can, if you can measure the apparent, and if you know the distance, then you can figure out the intrinsic luminosity or the total luminosity at the source. Go ahead and write down that uh, vocabulary term, intrinsic luminosity or intrinsic brightness. There's a lot of different ways to express brightness and luminosity. Um, but the word intrinsic is important for any of those. The in intrinsic brightness, the intrinsic luminosity um, is, is what we actually want to know. So in other words, if we see something really bright like Sirius, is it bright because it's really close? Or is it bright because even though it's far away, it's really, really bright? Okay. And so we want to be able to know that. And we can know that, the intrinsic brightness of it. Is it a 60-watt bulb, you know, really close? Or is it a 5,000-watt blowtorch, you know, a couple miles away? Because they'll both have the same apparent brightness, you know. Uh, and so what we want to do is, you know, have we got a 60-watt bulb or a 5,000-watt uh, blowtorch? So, uh, and this uh, kind of backwards calculation allows us to get us. Here's a diagram from the textbook. I think this is 12.2. Uh, we already discussed this. And this is the sun again at the center. And here's a little panel, one square meter, um, out at a distance of one astronomical unit. So that's one Earth, that's at Earth's orbit. Now, Mars is out here between one and two. It's at about 1.5 astronomical units. And so you see that the same amount of energy that spread corner to corner on this one square meter at one AU, by the time it gets twice as far out at two AUs, it's now spread out over four square meters. And by the time it gets out to three AUs, it's spread out over nine square meters. And so when the distance doubles, the area that the energy spread out over goes up by four, two to the second power. So make a note of that. Distance doubles, area increases by four. Distance triples, area increases by nine, three to the second power. And so if you're going in terms of watts per square meter, you know, let's say that this is one watt and this is one square meter here. Well, that one watt is now spread out over um, four square meters at here at a distance of two AUs. So that's one divided by four. Over here, it's one watt, but now it's spread out over nine squares, nine square meters. So the intensity is down to one ninth, 0 0.11. And right here at two AUs, it, or uh, yeah, right, here's two AUs right here. Uh, that's down to uh, 0 0.25 watts per square meter. Uh, and so, you know, here's another way to look at it, all right? Now, here's four rays of light penetrating this sphere here. Okay, here's the star down here in the lower left. Okay, and if this is your collection device, um, you catch all four rays. Okay, you get four photons of light. All right, now, if you double the distance, out to here, okay, here's double the distance. All right, go ahead and sketch that in your notes. And now take your same device and move it out here. Um, you're gonna only get, you know, like these two right here. 
This one's going to miss, right? And this one's going to miss. And so, um, so what you the the problem that you've got over here is that these rays, you know, eventually they're, they're going to start missing your detector, and that means that your detector detects less light. If you double the distance, the detection value goes down by one fourth. If you triple it, it goes down by one ninth. If you take it to the twenty fifth, twenty five times the distance, it goes by one over 25 to the second power, 1 over 625, so on and so forth. So that's the inverse square law. So as I said, um, it's about 1,367 watts per square meter. And out at Mars's orbit, it's way down to 589. At Neptune's orbit, uh, watts per square meter on your detector, you know, you have a one meter, one square meter detector out there at Neptune's orbit, you're only getting 1.5 watts. So this baby, okay, your one square watt meter here, or your one square meter solar cell, you could run a hair dryer off this baby, all right? But down here at Neptune, okay, maybe you could uh, operate a little night light or something like that, all right? It's pretty pathetic. And right here, you could measure... I don't know, what's, what's a 600 watt device? Uh, I don't know, maybe a stereo. A stereo set might, might work. You know, you might get a good stereo at 600 watts. I'm not really sure about stereos. Anybody here have a, a nice speaker system? Because I know they, they rate those in watts. In your car? Anybody have a, a good set of speakers in their car? Yeah, what was the wattage rating? Dude, you're still here. Good. Three thousand, ooh, dude. So your car—that's in your car or at home. A thousand watts for a speaker in your car, dude. So you're one of those cars that shakes as it goes down the road when you when you're dropping the bass in there. Yeah, sweet. I like that. At least I like it for a minute or so. Then I get tired of it when I see that traffic. Uh, anyway, the problem is that, you know, watts, watts per square meter are not so hot for measuring a star's luminosity. Yeah, we could figure it out, but from a star, the number of photons that you're getting from a star, when you're out there looking uh, naked eye uh, up at the stars, oh, tomorrow, tonight is yellow, so it's still a maybe. For the observer, anybody looking at it right now? Could somebody look that up and tell us before the end of class what the, what is it? Still yellow? Yeah, no. Well, hopefully the rain will decide to take off for a couple hours. Anyways, that's the way it always is. You know, you go if you can, if the weather cooperates, and otherwise you're toast. Uh, anyways. So uh, the, the number, if you're out there looking at a star like the North Star or Vega uh, or Sirius, you're getting a very small number of photons from the surface of that star. You know, dozens of photons per second. Your eye is phenomenally sensitive. But even so, we use a telescope to increase the number of photons that fall into your eyes, that makes things brighter, and, uh, and also we can magnify the images with, and so forth with telescopes. But um, the alternate route for rating um, brightness, you wouldn't call it luminosity, you would call it brightness, is the magnitude system. All right? And it was invented by the ancient Greeks. And they said that the brightest star was magnitude 1 and that the dimmest star possible was magnitude 6. Right? 
And so it's kind of like reverse psychology, and it, it, it drives you crazy trying to keep it all in place. A high magnitude means um, dim, relatively dim. A small magnitude or even a negative magnitude number uh, means relatively bright. Now, in the modern system, we've um, decided to make it all run by uh, logarithms and powers of 10 and stuff. And what we do now is use the bright star Vega, which is up during the summer, as our zero point. The zero point of the modern magnitude system. The Greeks didn't have a, a zero magnitude, but being nerds, science nerds of the 17th and 18th and 19th century, 20th century, and now the 21st, um, we use the zero point. Now, six magnitude is the dimmest star visible to the naked eye. And in this system, the magnitude of Sirius, um, little m, uh, the apparent magnitude of Sirius is minus one. Right? So Sirius is not a one. It's not a zero. It's even deeper below zero. It's a minus one. And check this out. The apparent magnitude of the SUN is negative 27. So that's actually the, the brightest star in the sky. So bright, we call it the SUN, and it defines the day. Whereas all the other stars avoid the day, and you can only see them at night. They're there, up there in the sky, but you just can't see them because the sun is so bright. So the apparent magnitude of the sun. Now, if you were to compare, if you were the same distance, you know, like 25 light years away from uh, Sirius and 25 light years away from the sun, the sun would be looking pretty pokey. Okay, the sun is no great shakes. Sirius is pretty bright, no matter where you, you know, where you look at it from. So let's make a table here. Here's some objects. Vega's in the center of the table. And we got the sun, the full moon, Venus, and Sirius. Here's Vega, the reference. Alpha Centauri A. And then here's some other stars that you can see. Antares and Polaris. Polaris is the north star. I mean, we can always see that if the night is clear. And then a draw Andromeda galaxy, you can actually I think you might be able to see it now. It's up at night uh, in the summer, I know, and uh, it's, be it's a beautiful. Th it's very tough to see. You have to have really dark nights, clear skies, you know. So no moon and clear skies. Okay, so remember, brighter is toward the top. So my low magnitude numbers, and, and you know, sun is negative twenty-seven. Uh, that's going to be towards the top. And then down here, we're going to have some dimmer stuff. The Andromeda galaxy is pretty dim. They're the nucleus of it anyways. Uh, but you can make it out. And so we'll just kind of anchor everything with zero for Vega. Okay, so this is the magnitude at Earth, little m. Right Now, these are numbers. There's no units, so this is not zero watts per square meter or zero joules per second or anything like that. It's just a number. And we interpret it in the magnitude system uh, relative to Vega. Now let's get some of the other uh, data in here. We're going to do the magnitude, and you can calculate this uh, using logarithms and stuff. It's a pain in the you-know-what. We're not going to calculate anything with it, but I'm going to give you these numbers. This is called the absolute magnitude. It gets the symbol capital M. Okay, and this is the intrinsic brightness, the intrinsic magnitude, and this is the apparent magnitude over here. So for this middle column, put apparent magnitude at Earth, and for this one, absolute magnitude. That's the one that really, you know, this is the one where you're, you're 20, well, 10 parsecs away from each of these stars. Then you can... Um, use their uh, relative brightness uh, as an intrinsic measure. So let's look at first the sun. Okay, if you were 10 parsecs away from the sun, about 32.6 light years, um, the magnitude of the sun would be, god damn, 4.83. You could see it. 
it's almost a five, so it's it's getting pretty dim, but you can see it. We can see fives. You know, so if, if Earth were 10 parsecs from the sun, that's how bright it would be. All right. If we sent a spacecraft 10 parsecs from sun and they look back, that's how bright the sun would be. All right. The full moon. Uh, the at apparent magnitude is minus 13. Okay, that's pretty bright. It's reflected sunlight. It's not a source of light. Uh, and forget about seeing it from 10 parsecs away, so just leave that blank. Um, Venus, also very bright, minus 5. Of all the planets, this one's usually the brightest. And uh, because it's fairly close to Earth, and when it reflects light from the sun, it's not a source of light. Not very much light, anyways. Uh, and so it, it reflects sunlight. And, but it's, it's uh, a minus 5. And again, forget about trying to measure it from 10 parsecs away. Right? But now, here's Sirius. From Earth, it's a negative 1. All right? And that approximately. And that's the brightest star in the sky, other than the SUN. Now, if you're 10 parsecs away from the sun, you'd be at 1.42 absolute capital M magnitude. All right, so that's not too shabby. All right, that's good and bright. Now we're even closer than that, and we see it at a minus one. That's even brighter, apparently. Uh, but even if we were 10 parsecs away, uh, it would be, it would still be pretty good and bright. Okay, Vega, zero and 0 0.58. So that tells you that we're fairly close um, to Vega. We're actually a little bit closer than 10 parsecs away from Vega because if we were exactly 10 parsecs away from Vega then this would be 0 and 0. But this one's a little bit bigger than 0 so that means um, that we're actually that this is uh, means we're actually a little bit closer than 10 parsecs. Alpha Centauri A almost a 0, 0 0.01 uh, but if we were 10 parsecs away from it, 4.83. Uh, IQ test, which is, has more intrinsic brightness, judging by the third column, the absolute magnitude column, which is intrinsically brighter, the SUN or Alpha Centauri A? Alpha Centauri A, that's right. So make a note, little star, brighter than the sun, intrinsically brighter than the sun. So if we were one astronomical unit away from Alpha Centauri A, it's very similar to the sun. It's like a cousin. Uh, if we were one astronomical unit away, uh, we'd be getting a solar constant of, I don't know, 1,500 watts per square meter, maybe. A little bit more than 1,367, simply because it's intrinsically brighter, just by a little bit. It's a little bit less magnitude, therefore a little bit more brightness. Antares, a giant star, magnitude 1, bright, it's a good bright star, and we can see it at night, and whoa, 10 parsecs away, it would be as bright, it would be uh, brighter than Venus. Nice, really bright. So we're a little bit far away, so we're only getting a magnitude 1, apparently, at Earth. So it seems dimmer than it actually is. Here's what its actual uh, brightness rating is. The true brightness rating. And here's the apparent. So we're a little bit further away than 10 parsecs, but still pretty bright. And 10 parsecs away, whoo, thing is blazing. Polaris. Okay, Polaris is at about 2 apparent magnitude. And it comes in at a nice, juicy negative 3.63, so it's blazing as well. Polaris is a nice star, my friend. I mean, in terms of stars, Polaris and Antares, yup, they're big and they're bright. Okay, and this one on Earth, Polaris looks a little bit dimmer than Antares, but it's it's brighter. Uh, actually, this is the this is the dimmest of all the 
stars on here, apparent magnitude. And this still, this is pretty good. Now, absolute magnitude, it's number two. Well, yeah, absolute magnitude is number two. This is two, this is one, uh, three, four, five, and the sun is six. Okay, Andromeda galaxy, this is the nucleus. It's not a star. You can't really rate this one for absolute magnitude, but um, the nucleus is rated at uh, apparent magnitude 3.44 on Earth. So, because um, 10 parsecs away from a, a, a galaxy, I mean, the galaxy is like, you know, hundreds of light years across. So 10 parsecs, that would be saying like, well, I'm a millimeter away from the space shuttle. You know, what does that mean? You know, it's not really a distance. You know, you can't really say you're distant. That's like saying you're right on top of the space shuttle. So, so this, this is another one where where the the object is so big you don't even bother rating its absolute magnitude. I mean, you could, but it, it wouldn't be meaningful. But apparent magnitude 3.44. So this is actually the dimmest. Um, and if we were all 10 parsecs away. Uh, Antares would be the brightest, and the sun would be the dimmest. So, actually, these guys would be the dimmest, but... Now, I have a brain-burning question for you. One more question with your clicker. Let's see if you can handle it. And go ahead and talk it over with your neighbor if you feel motivated to do so. If a star's apparent magnitude m is less than its absolute magnitude, then which will it be? How saith you A, B, C, or no D. One of the three. Bruce. M is, a, yeah, M is a smaller number than capital M. Okay, so like one and two, you know. And actually, I answered this question when I was talking about that table about three times. All right. 15 seconds. Make your decision. The brain zapper. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So, 63% vote for A, 9 vote for, C, for B, and 40 voted for C. All right, let's see, let's see what we got here. Um, So M is less than, so that's like a magnitude, a little M of zero versus absolute magnitude of two, right? So that means that if we were 10 parsecs away, its apparent magnitude would be two. But because the apparent magnitude is zero, that means we're closer than 10 parsecs. So this one is the right, whoops, this one right here is the right answer. All right, let's dismiss a little early today. You'll have some homework over the weekend. Uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you.